Kentucky, really during this antebellum time, we were in the forefront. Uh, some of the shining stars here, of course, Henry Clay. Henry Clay. The Great Compromise of 1850. Yes, and several others. Several he, others. So many compromises, he was known as the Great Compromise. Uh, Richard Mentor Johnson, he wrote from the War of 1812 and Vice President under Martin Van Buren. John C. Breckinridge. His nephew later was John Breckinridge, congressman yes. from Fayette County, who I worked for. Oh, really? As his administrative assistant and field representative. Well, they were in politics for a long time. Uh, John C., of course, being vice president. And then, of course, he, he becomes a Confederate general and actually the Confederate secretary of war. One of his uncles who helped raise him, Robert Jefferson Breckinridge, was a big union man. Mm -hmm. And then John Crittenden, author of the Crittenden Compromise, got a futile attempt to postpone the put off the Civil War. What do we have here? Well, we have a tavern, Traveler's Haven. <laughs> now, it doesn't look like Holiday Inn, and usually when you uh, go to, you know, and you decide you're going to stay at a certain hotel, you don't have to share your room with total strangers and sleep four to a bed in a bug infested bed. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Stagecoaches gave you a pretty bumpy ride, and of course, if you think they went fast, you're just wrong. <laughs> now, what period, was this, what period was what period was this in? This Still was antebellum. Antebellum. Mm -hmm. Okay, that would have been about what years? Well, um, roughly 1800 to right up to the Civil War. Uh, here's the um, Reliance line of stages. And they're bragging that they can give you such a fast tri trip between Lexington and Louisville. You left Louisville at 4 o'clock in the morning and you arrived in Lexington the same evening at 6 o'clock. It's amazing. Railroads were looming, though. In steamboat travel, I like the quote, uh, to feel what an invention this is for these regions, one must have seen and felt the difficulty and danger of forcing a boat against the current of these mighty rivers. You are invited to a breakfast at 70 miles distance. You get on board the passing steamboat and awake in the morning in season for your appointment. And that's a, a quote from Timothy Flint, 1810. <laughs> Early musical traditions. Taylor, Armstrong. <laughs> now, who is this? That's James Taylor. He, well, he's famous portrait painters of Ant the antebellum South was a man named Matthew Jewett, and he painted this portrait of Justice Thomas Todd, the first Kentuckian to sit on the U.S. Supreme Court. Huh. Audubon, of course. Yep. Yeah. Quite a few Audubons. Uh, these are the rarest things in the entire collection. They're a portrait, a set of portraits of Dennis and Diademia Dorn. Um, as far as we know, a one of a kind, as, as soon as you say that, somebody will have some. But they, they are a portrait of a free African American couple in Danville. 1839. Hmm. Beautiful. We have wonderful diaries. Uh, antebellum ladies were great diarists, letter writers. So we quote them quite liberally here at the History Center. Only folks quite wealthy could have their portraits done. This is an extremely wealthy couple from Lexington. I wonder who they are. Victor and Elizabeth Flournoy. What about this?
Maybach, be my guest. Mmm. Tehran Hapapuk, huh? <laughs> mm. From Bath County. From Bath County. Beautiful. Works, though. Who's the picture of? That is Dr. Ephraim McDowell. Oh, yeah. Famous my surgeon. First successful abdominal surgery. There were all sorts of home remedies in antebellum Kentucky. Some of the remedies sound much worse than the ailment itself. Now we have so many things from the wealthy. Well, let's face it, they had more stuff. Yeah. But uh, actually they were the minority. There were many, many more people uh, poor, very small middle class. To cure a headache, why take a strong laxative, of course, and raise blisters over the head? Hmm. Oh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Belly ache? Mm -hmm. Measles. It just, they thought, you know, get it out of you. You know, it's, you're sick because you, there's bad, evil bad, yeah. vapors. And so if you could. What for the common cough? I wonder what they did. Get enough out. Drink a half cup of mixture of boiled flaxseed, sugar candy, gum of Arabic, lemon juice, and vinegar. That's from Kentucky Housewife, 1839. <clears throat> War and the aftermath, huh? Mm-hmm. Where are we now? Of course, we are coming into the Civil War section. Mm -hmm. Kentucky was a very divided state. There was resistance to slavery. Uh, I guess the Underground Railroad operated, certainly, in Kentucky. Um, you can hear stories of trying to escape. Uh, this is a story from, not a story, it's, a, it's a, from the memoirs of Isaac Johnson, who wrote a book called Slavery Days in Kentucky. Now, he's young here. He doesn't make it. Uh, later, he would escape slavery by joining the U.S. Army in 1863. Well, good day. I am Reverend J.W. Logan, the minister of the People's Amy Zion Church out of Syracuse, New York. I am an abolitionist and conductor and chief agent on the Underground Railroad and a fugitive slave. I was once a slave born and raised on a plantation in Tennessee, five miles outside of Nashville. In the year of 1834, I made my escape, made my way up to Canada, and did the work of the Underground Railroad out of Syracuse, New York. I urge you all to be modern day conductors, to help your fellow man. Thank you. And God bless you all. I remember teaching a unit on black history at, at Erlanger Lloyd High School in 1970 when I taught uh, American U.S. history there and Kentucky history and advanced government. And I remember taking a uh, African American history course, they called it black history back in those days, and that was in the 1968-69 year at the University of Kentucky with uh, Dr. Stephen Channing. In fact, that was the first uh, course of that type that was offered at the University of Kentucky. And, uh, of course, it was great to be there with uh, uh, our dear friend Dr. Thomas Clark in the early 60s and later with Dr. Charles Talbert at uh, the Community College and Dr. Thomas and uh, many other great history teachers. But one group of folks that were uh, brought to the new nation, frankly unwillingly, were uh, the tribes and groups of the Asantes, Igbos, Congos, and many other African tribes. And uh, we, um, we realized that they were brought against their will, and uh, um, it was a tragic time. Uh, they were torn from their homes and their culture, and they were enslaved in the labor and brought over by chains. Uh, it was a treacherous and dangerous trip uh, from 
the Ivory Coast or the Gulf Coast. It involved uh, the forced migration of 10 to 15 million Africans. One to two million died aboard ship in the infamous Middle Passage, they called it. Uh, but there were some that survived, um, and uh, uh, they uh, tell their story in great uh, detail uh, throughout the years. Um, the um, trip was uh, followed by sharks, uh, and frankly, many were thrown overboard to the sharks, and they were laid side by side. And uh, um, oh, I, I suppose that it would say uh, artisans uh, for over 400 years they were brought to the shores of uh, the United States or America as was in, not to pursue freedom, but to help in the dreams of others pursue their freedom as slaves. Um, we can see that um, uh, even the ministers of the time uh, spoke out in favor of the right to slavery. Uh, the politicians uh, uh, rationalized it uh, as being property rights. Uh, the African Negro is destined by providence, they'd say, to occupy this condition of servitude uh, or servile independence. He is in all respects physically, moral, and politically inferior, they would say. Uh, tragedy as it was. But uh, sold and, and uh, into slavery in all 13 colonies and quickly became the driving force of the colonial economy. In the south they were forced to work uh, the tobacco farms along the Chesapeake Bay and the rice fields of the Carolinas and Georgia. Um, in the north New York City held uh, the second highest number of slaves in the colonies. Uh, only South Carolina held more. Uh, and by 1790 nearly 20 percent of the population were enslaved African Americans. A startling fact that most people don't know uh, that I found extremely interesting. Little change as the, as the colonies became a nation. The acquisition of new territories fueled slavery's expansion westward and along with the invention of the cotton gin created the vast cotton kingdom of the deep south. It was an economic matter. This was property to these folks and money. And money as we know is the root of all evil. Men, women, and children were worked like animals. And uh, it, enslavement was endless, endlessly passed down from parent to child. Um, tragedy. Uh, in 1808, importing slaves to America was made illegal in 1808. The demand for free labor then shifted from Africa to a thriving domestic slave trade. Uh, the auction block where families were separated. Uh, uh, you can see that families were now routinely separated and sold down the river, so to speak, to deadly sugar and cotton plantations never to see one another again. Uh, the young nation's language of freedom simply did not apply to these Americans. Freedom for who? <laughs> this exclusion was broadly justified by um, articles and, and scientific proof of inferiority of the African Americans. Ministers used the Bible even to claim that God ordained their enslavement, if you can believe that. Um, and the Constitution sanctioned slavery, certifying a slave to be three-fifths of a man. This was the real problem. Slavery was fully supported by the country's legal and political system. Eleven of the first fifteen presidents owned slaves. Congress wrote laws protecting the institution. And while he was still Speaker of the House, President James Polk engineered passage of the gag rule forbidding even the discussion of slavery in the House of Representatives. Too many slaves. Slavery was a political and economic issue protected by the doctrine of states' rights, they claimed. Oh, sadness. Tragedy and sadness. By the 16, 1860s, four million enslaved African Americans had become the nation's most valuable commodity 
money again, surpassing the combined value of, of America's railroads, banks, and factories. One of these commodities was Harriet Jacobs. What a story she has to tell. Of course, as she would say, my master said, do you know what I have to like? Uh, that I can kill you if I please, her master said. Uh, in 1835, Harriet Jacobs uh, and an enslaved mother in North Carolina could no longer tolerate her owner's sexual advances. She finally hid way in a tiny crawl space above her grandfather's porch. There by day she watched her unknowing children. And at night she sought hope and solace. Countless were the nights that I sat late at that tiny loophole scarcely large enough to give me the glimpse of one twinkling star. There I heard the slave hunters conferring about the capture of runaways, well knowing how rejoiced they would be to catch me. Oh, what fear had to be startling through her mind. Uh, the tragedy of Harriet Jacobs. She hid in that crawl space for seven years. Her refusal to submit was part of a long legacy of resistance by enslaved African Americans. This is the true history, the real history. From rebellious rebellions and suicides aboard slave ships, to sabotage production on plantations, and even to armed insurrections. Yes, they did fight back. They tried, but they were outarmed and outnumbered. It's fully documented in some of the brochures that you see. In early 1900, opposition to slavery gathered strength in the North, and a small group, but diverse group, argued that slavery was more than a political and economic and legal issue. It was a moral issue. It began as a small group, as most things do. Ministers and social progressives, black and white people of all faiths, joined together. They published newspapers and books calling for the abolition of slavery. Lydia Child expressed the abolitionist outrage. The Constitution has been systematically nullified, she said, whenever it suited the convenience of the slave power. Women circulated petitions for the first time participating in the political arena. Abolitionists began to secretly aid runaways. It what, and what became known as the Underground Railroad, they transported escaping slaves and opened their homes as sanctuaries or stations. Mm. Of course, that's what we're looking at today here at Freedom Institution. Some runaways moved from station to station. Others made it to freedom on their own. Either way, escape was a very dangerous thing and the road ahead of vast unknown space. Thank <laughs> you. 
That'll be Mr. Parker, God willing. Shall we bring weapons of our own, Father? The law claims for stealing property. We'll have no plea for self-defense. Give our thanks to Mr. Collins. Be careful. Godspeed. I won't park off. He's breaking the law. And I'm gonna get him. Come on. Cross the shallows up the river. Abraham Lincoln's pocket watch. Oh my. Isn't that a blessing? Oh, absolutely. Blessing. Real nice straight line down to us, so that's true of the <laughs> provenance. It's ironic that Kentucky was one of the most divided states, if not the most divided state in the Union during the war, and both presidents were born here, both Lincoln and Davis. Pro produced both, Lincoln and Davis? Mm -hmm. The north and the south. Ironical. We really cover the medical story um, quite well here at the History Center. We cover the actual, you know, the battle scenes and the battle details at our military history museum, which is up in the old arsenal. Mm -hmm. Of course, more soldiers died of disease during the Civil War than before being shot. Yeah. These are images of folks who were affected and went through the Civil War. And I'm sure their stories are all based, are different based on their gender, their age, their race, certainly, whether they were a slave or a slave owner. Who are these bust of, do you? Well, we have several different ones. Brian McGoffin was the yeah. Civil War governor who favored neutrality, but ultimately was an untenable position. John Crittenden, uh, uh, author of the Crittenden Compromise, which would, of course, stop the war. And Jeremiah Boyle, who, um, Jeremiah Tilford Boyle, um, Union occupation was not pleasant, and commanders such as Bull um, tried to, they had a hard job. They were trying to protect against guerrilla violence Warfare. to keep Kentucky Union, but uh, sometimes they were overzealous and, and really ended up being hated by a lot of the citizens. These are things from an archaeological dig that was um, actually conducted at Camp Nelson, hmm. which was the third largest recruiting center for African American soldiers during the war. Kentucky women at war here, huh? Mm -hmm. Kentucky women worked actually at the arsenal, uh, making cartridges, where our military history museum is now located. They also do things like roll bandages, knit socks, and of course shaker women cook. And a lot of the women cook for the soldiers. Uh, these are all uh, accounts that come directly from sort of the horse's mouth, so to speak. These are um, accounts of from women di via diaries. Then we move to continuity and change. Huh? Mm -hmm. This was after the Civil War. I guess Reconstruction. Well, we kind of cover that somewhat here. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, a lot of people did not give up the notion of slavery without a struggle. I mean, uh, the violence in Kentucky was horrendous for decades after the war, and lynching becomes a, a serious problem.
and the onset of the Ku Klux Klan. At one time had numbers across the nation of thousands of members. It's been said of Kentucky that they joined the Confederacy after the war was over, which doesn't seem like a smart thing to do. What do you think, fellas? Pretty neat, huh? Yep. What's our next area here? The Victorian era. First named for Queen Victoria okay. of England, who reigned a very long time. And she was um, influential in, in all matters of, things. well, like style, the way she mourned the loss of Prince Albert. Um, and a lot of people adopted these customs. The Civil War really fueled a lot of industry. It took a lot of um, factories to keep those armies going. Armies bought all manner of things from factories. After the war's over, those factories don't want to stop making money, so they think of other things to produce and sell folks. You start seeing mass production of furniture. You could order that organ from Montgomery Ward. Hmm. Trains become so, so important, so vital, moving all these goods across the country. And this is when people start moving from the country to, to cities. And I see we have Baby the Cat down there moving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who are the pictures of the ladies, do we know? Those are Bowie's. Um, Catherine Bowie cinched in those waist corsets. But, you know, you, you think they've come come just legions from that pioneer cabin and in many ways they have but basically mm -hmm. they're washing clothes pretty much in the same way. <laughs> yeah. But women are starting to take on different roles. Uh, women are starting to become secretaries and of course mm -hmm. after the Civil War, nurses. Now this is the, one of the first. Uh, it's a, what's my job? We have lots of these around. This woman is a secretary. Yeah. One of the highlights of this period was a huge fail that happened in Louisville. It was called the Southern Exposition. It was supposed to last one summer, 1883. But it would last for four summers. My, oh my. They were showing off factory made plows, factory, all manner of um, factory made goods. Uh, one of the highlights, though, were the light bulbs. Thomas Edison himself uh, installed 4,800 incandescent lights. Mm. Strange and wonderful things, odd things. Geological specimens, artwork. They're beginning into mechanization, huh? Absolutely. Notice the difference in the plows. Mm -hmm. Wood to metal. That's right. Hmm. In 1899, Senator William Goble ran for governor. He lost by 2,000 votes, but he thought he'd been cheated, so he contested his loss. Um, as he approached the Capitol, which was, is now affectionately termed the Old Capitol, uh, someone shot him from the Secretary of State's office. Um, the Secretary of State's name was Caleb Powers. Um, he was carried to the Capitol Hotel. He was later sworn in uh, as governor. This is the coat he was wearing when he was shot. Hmm. Let me hit that button again. The bullet enters the front. It goes out the back. I think it's the exit wound that did he need. That's how we kicked off the new century. And he was sworn in so they could replace him, right? 
with the lieutenant governor. Yes. Some say he might have been sworn in on his deathbed. Yes, well, he was sworn in on his deathbed. It's just, did they swear in a corpse or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, he was the last governor elected from northern Kentucky. Oh, really? And uh, from either party. And uh, actually, the last governor that was elected that actually served from northern Kentucky is the same name as mine, John Stevenson. John White Stevenson. Right. And I was the first constitutional office holder elected from northern Kentucky from either party in over 70 years when I was elected superintendent of education for the state of Kentucky. Okay. 1992. Okay. Yes, I remember that. The new century features, you know, all those factories and trains. Well, it took a lot of coal. It took a lot of coal to, to make them go. So we feature a coal mine, a company store. The old company store. Mm -hmm. Some people say man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bones A mind that's weak and a back that's strong You load sixteen times and what did you get? Another day older and deeper in debt San Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go I owe my soul oh, To the company store I bet you didn't expect that, did you? I did. That's wonderful. <laughs> this is the second impromptu concert here. Um, several years ago, a lady just broke out into Coal Miner's Daughter right here. <laughs> well, that song was written by Merle Travis, Travis. from Kentucky. That's right. Of course, sang by Tennessee Ernie Ford. Mm -hmm. And I've had the good fortune to sing it to every county in the state. Oh, that's what, <laughs> what a notoriety. This is an Owensboro wagon. Fun Owensboro wagon. It was like the Detroit. Owensboro was the Detroit of the buggy industry, but by 1957 it went out of business. Of course, I'm sure because of the car. I have a beautiful quilt from down in Owensboro, Davies County, called "Around the World Trip Around the World." Oh, it was handmade. Yeah, I bought down there. And speaking of Eastern Kentucky and Pike County, we just lost a. Uh, uh, John Stevenson, or James Stevenson, who passed away, who's going to have his laying out service uh, tomorrow night down here in Frankfurt. He was in his 80s and distant Ken. In fact, when I ran, I claimed that I only carried Pike County because he was so popular He's down so there. so popular. And he was on the Supreme Court for a long time and fought yeah. for minors' rights. Oh, okay. And uh, he and his wife helped me with the Kentucky Mental Health Association when I flew around the state with uh, okay. Charlene Carroll and yes. Jean Ford, Wendell yes. Ford's wife, promoting mental health. We have the company store. We have a section called Progress and Reform. We have opposing views. Here's Madeline McDowell Breckenridge saying, Kentucky women are not idiots, even though they are closely related to Kentucky men. <laughs> you can hear an actress giving you her words. And then Henry Watterson, the opposite view. Can we hear uh, hers? Yes. Punch that there and let's get that on tape. On the whole, the South has done less for the general protection of women and children than any other part of America. The Southern gentleman is back in the Middle Ages when it comes to chivalry. He believes in other men protecting their women, as he protects or would fight if it were the man that should protect his women. He overlooks the fact that some women may not have a chivalrous man. Now here we have modern age coming in with the jazz age. It is, and uh, also because of radio programs that were broadcast across the country, magazines with countrywide circulation, uh, you have people becoming more alive, you know? Yeah. Uh, we have Eric Johnson right now, who's 89 years old, to plays fiddle with us, and he's won, he's won the Kentucky Old Time Fiddlers Contest. Okay, okay. Harold Zimmerman. We have a wonderful tradition of Kentucky writers. 
Oh yeah, some wonderful authors. I just got a book written by this Dick David Dick. I think David his name. David Dick, yes. Yeah, my son bought it for me. It's autographed by him about Jesse Stewart. And of course, Dr. Clark's books, I've got several of those. And I had Kentucky history myself, four years of it, under Dr. Charles Talbert, who was a great historian who lived in Lexington and taught both at UK Kentucky history and taught at the community college in northern Kentucky for many years. Depression and war. Kentucky, we show the depression in a rural setting because we were a rural state. And it's not that the Depression was any easier here. I mean, people starved to death in Kentucky just as they did across the country. It's just that the, the prices people were getting for their tobacco, that was so depressed. And basically, well, Kentuckians had been practicing for the Depression for a decade before it hit. And they'd gotten pretty good at it. Gotten pretty good at it, and they, they knew how to raise a garden. They didn't starve that way. Of course, the first and the main and the most important thing, you got a light that you could really read by. I wasn't 17. I was 17 years old before we got running water and electricity. electricity. Lived in a little four-room frame house in the house out of Independence, Kentucky mm -hmm. on Martin Road. And uh, so I remember that old wash machine right there. Of course, I remember the, the, the wash tub. Oh, yes. We heated all of our water in that tub on the cold stove. And you might put it at the foot of the bed to warm you a little bit in the cold room. Oh, happy. <laughs> Many factories changed their production equipment during World War II. Like, for instance, Louisville Slugger. They went from baseball bats to rifle stocks. A company in West Kentucky that made silk shirts before the war, parachutes. So parachutes. What you got in there? Alvin Barkley. Isn't that something? Those old campaign buttons. I remember when Alvin Barkley was audited after he left office and uh, a friend of mine was doing the audit. His name was Robert Higgins from uh, down in western Kentucky mm -hmm. and he told me that was the first audit that he was sent to be to do and uh, unfortunately even though he was vice president of the United States uh, died an impoverished man. The only money he had was uh, a little bit of money in cash in his pocket.
when those who can no longer afford the cost of health care push it on to those who can't afford the cost of health care, that is not a solution. That's right. When those that you elect to come to Frankfurt to solve the problem push the problem on to those who elected them, that is not a solution. We as elected officials are elected. We're given your trust. You give us the trust to come up here and try to find solutions to these difficult problems. And trust me, these are very difficult, complex issues. No simple answer is going to fix these problems. But certainly, shifting the cost from the state onto those that are disabled and those that are blind, which is 50% of the cost of Medicaid, is not going to solve this problem. Right. We have to come up with substantial changes in the health care delivery system. We have a crisis in health care. It costs too much, it covers too few, and the quality is going down, and we have got to fix the health care delivery system. And we don't do that by who pays for it or who else pays for it. We do that by a complete overhaul of the current health care delivery system. We have to because it costs too much for the state, it costs too much for taxpayers, it costs too much for GM, it costs too much for Ford, it costs too much for grandmother and grandfather, mom and pop, and small businesses alike, and for politicians to say we're going to, blind, we're going to blindly not do anything about it and just shove the cost on to teachers, state workers, or the disabled and the blind is wrong. And those people who tell you that need to be eliminated. you to continue your voice because here is your voice. Let it rise up to the chambers on each side of this building and tell them that we can no longer tolerate this type of leadership in Frankfurt or in Washington. We will not tolerate that and make sure your voices are heard in November of each year because that's how we solve this problem. Thank you all. You know, uh, the other day when I called Senator Mangiardo and Senator Harris, they were tied up in committee meetings, and both of them have made a special effort to be here today. And Senator Westwood might be over just a little later. Senator Harris, say just a word. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity just to say a couple words. I'm Ernie Harris from Oldham County, and I'm glad to be here. I would like to say also that you all are well represented in Frankfurt folks that come to us, we always give them a hearing, we always try to make sure that your views are well known and that we can do whatever we can to help. And I'm uh, privileged to be here, I look forward to working with you in the future, and thanks so much for just giving me a few minutes to say hi and we welcome everybody to Frankfurt. Thank you. Thank you. All the distance that you have to be here with us today on this very important day. Uh, some of the things that Senator Manjardo said reminds us why today is so very important, and that is to let our voices be heard. We must remain vocal. Come on. Yeah. We must remain visible. Yeah. We've got to be here. Yeah. We've got to let them know that we're not going to sit quietly by while they make decisions about us without them. But he was a great orator, one of the greatest, and he was a good Christian man. Yeah. With their forty-fives, lots of magazines with you know nationwide publications circu or circulation. Huh. Pure Kentucky. Well, we've had our stars, including my family, the Robinson family singers, have spent the last 27 years on the road entertaining and just opened a big entertainment center up in, on Swope Road in Owen County called the Kentucky Jamboree. They have traveled, a, well, ever since our first campaign, in the 70s, they went across the state with me in an old Silver Sides Greyhound bus 
singing from county to county. Hey, that's a great way to communicate. <laughs> well, my carpool is good. And thank you so you much. So You've done a wonderful time. job taking us through thank the you. life of Kentucky. Good luck. And your last name is? Jenny. Thank you so much, you Ann. So welcome. It's a pleasure. Bless your heart. Thank you. Bye now. Driving along I-75 South here, headed down to Frankfurt uh, for the naming of the center, uh, history center after Dr. Thomas Clark. I just happened to see uh, a gentleman walking along carrying this cross. I thought it would be interesting to stop and chat with him for a second. Well, we were traveling down to Frankfurt today to the uh, grand opening and new naming of the Kentucky History Center after the famous historian Dr. Thomas Clark, who passed away last week, whose birthday would have been 102 years old. Uh, Kentucky's history, history uh, laureate from uh, many years. And uh, we happen to be passing another gentleman who's making history uh, all across America for the Lord. Chuck, tell us, uh, we picked you up today on I-75 South. Tell us where you've been and where you've been headed and what you're about. Well, just a reminder, John, that uh, you need the Lord Jesus in your life. I started originally back in 86. I've been on this journey uh, carrying the cross since 1999, so it's been a long journey. I started out at Tijuana, Mexico. I had brought $55 with me. That's what the Lord told me to take with me. I got rid of all of my possessions. And uh, when I went out to purchase the materials of the cross, it ended up costing me $53 and some change. So God knew the exact dollar that I needed. And I took off and I just said, Lord, I'll go as far as you want to take me. And so far since that day, I've been to the East Coast five times, back to California four. I've been through every state except for Alaska and Hawaii. But it's just a reminder that you need God in your life daily. I do it basically 365 days a year. Um, just, uh, just a reminder that you need to put God in your life first, and uh, everything else is second. And how do you feel about traveling through Kentucky? Uh, well, Kentucky's a really pretty state, you know, but I, I hear we need, a, again, a big spiritual awakening. I, you know, I notice that uh, I'll carry the cross a lot and a lot, uh, and it seems like uh, I don't get the response like I would get normally. Like if I'm in Texas, I can't go a mile without two cars pulling over to help out, or just to say what, what's up. And so I'm here trying to stir some souls, and I hope that, you know, this just by carrying the cross, it'll just remind people to get uh, focused on Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the Lord and Savior, God Almighty, the true, true of one, true God. And I just want to get people out there and get them encouraged to, to get Christ in their hearts and, uh, you know, just have favor with the Lord. And if people wanted to get in touch with you or help out, uh, what's the name of your website? Well, I've got a website. It's crosscarrierchuck.com. You'd like to go under Google, put www.cross, just C R O S S, carrier, C A R R I E R, chuck, C H U C K dot com. And it'll bring up the website. It'll take, tell you a few of the stories, uh, how this started. I uh, started originally in the 80s. I started, I've had a total of four crosses, each one getting a little lighter. I started originally with an 86 pound solid oak cross. I was young and strong and I was on fire it's just after I received the Holy Spirit from the Lord. I started carrying that around Melpitas, California, which is where I'm from. And, uh, you know, basically on till this day and I'm still carrying the cross. And I haven't even been sick with a cold in 19 years since the day I started carrying the cross. So God has definitely put a hedge of protection over me. And he's always faithful, he's always good, but if you'd like to go up to the website, you can do that. There's uh, the PayPal program, if you'd like to help support the ministry, go through that. Or my uncle, Keith Taft, who resides in Sacramento, he has his address on there. Fantastic. Now, any family involved? Do you? No. Well, I'm not married. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, trying to, I'm writing a book about it. It's called I Carry the Cross, God Does All the Work. And uh, I've been on this journey six years, and I'm trying to make it a 10-year walk. And uh, after that, after I get the book completed, I'm 43 now, 
So by the time I get done with this journey, uh, hopefully then maybe if the book does well, uh, the Lord will bless me with a, a wife and somewhere down the future. Well, we'll June and I will both pray about that, and <laughs> we welcome you to Travels with the Stevensons, uh, our television show, and our special show on history, butterflies, flowers, birds, and uh, the people that love them and love good music. Amen. God bless you. and. To all of the listening audience, go get baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Very important. He said first be baptized by water, then by fire. And don't stop asking the Lord once you've been baptized for the Holy Spirit until it comes. If anybody stops you through Kentucky, you just tell them that Big John said you're a great soul for the Lord. <laughs> well, thank you, John. It's been a real blessing meeting you, and it's always a blessing to meet a brother in Christ. God bless you. Yes, God bless you. K107.5 Christian radio station, Tri-State Gospel, the uh, Hammond Broadcasting with Gil and Jan Hammond. And I think his name is Ken, but I'm not sure. But we'll find out if this is him. My name is Jen Ann Harris. I'm a lifelong member of the cathedral. And it's also Basilica, which is an honorary title given by the Pope to a church or a chapel or some outstanding feature of architecture or, or some historical event may have taken place. And all you have to do is look around this beautiful building and you can see where we meet those qualifications. Uh, we have gorgeous stained glass windows made in Munich, Germany. We have 14 beautiful stations of the cross, which are all mosaic, made in Venice, Italy. Each one has at least 70 tiny pieces of terceray or tiny pieces of tile. And according to many art critics, these mosaics are among the most beautiful in the world. Uh, the windows are fabulous. It doesn't make any difference what time of the day you come in, if it's sunshiny or rainy or foggy. The stained glass windows, as long as they have a little bit of light on the outside, are just spectacular. We underwent a big renovation about two years ago uh, with Bishop Munch, who has now been transferred down to New Orleans. Um, at that time, the altar was brought forward, the uh, pews were all cleaned and uh, moved around, and some of them were made much larger because they were rather uncomfortable. The church was started in 18, 1884 by Bishop uh, Paul Camillus Moss, who was from, it, from not it, he was from uh, Belgium, and he had seen all the beautiful Gothic buildings in Belgium and in France, and he had about $100,000, so he started this church at that time. Needless to say, he didn't get very far. He had another wonderful donation of 100000 and the parishioners in the area gave another 100000 So we say that today this is valued. This was built for maybe 300000 and for insurance purposes, it's valued for more than $40 million. The art in it could not be replaced. You have to come down and visit the church yourself for over from uh, 10 o'clock until 4 o'clock. And on Sunday, we have a mass at 10 o'clock with organ music. So call the cathedral and make arrangements to come. Or if you want to bring a group, you have to call. If you want to come on your own, you just walk in. You're always welcome. And Travels with the Stevensons filmed the Ball family singers here entertaining one night to an overflowing crowd. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful experience. Come and visit the uh, cathedral here for all faiths, right? Right, and we're open to all faiths. And God we, bless you. We are very ecumenical here. <laughs> well, thank you very much for this interesting uh, insight into the beauty of the structure here and the history of it. You're welcome. It's so delightful. I just love talking about it. Thank you so much.
family singers and God bless them.
service, the Navy, I believe. Well, I uh, enlisted in the Navy uh, about a month before I uh, graduated from high school, and uh, then I was, I was given a leave to finish my exams, and then I wasn't there for class night or for graduation, had to leave right for boot camp, and uh, I wanted to get in the Navy because I had just most of my friends in that ones that were older than, than myself uh, had gone into the Navy and uh, and one of the big reasons was uh, I was told by them that uh, the food was better than the Army <laughs> so uh, that took me that's one a big reason why I went in the Navy but anyway uh, we went through boot camp five and a half weeks nine day leaving home and uh, then uh, we were uh, supposed to go to service school but instead of that uh, they sent us out by train out to Shoemaker, California for a few days. And uh, then we boarded a troop ship, the USS General R.L. Howes, and uh, went over uh, seas. We stopped at Hawaii for a couple of days at Honolulu, and then we went to uh, Guadalcanal. They never needed any uh, replacements there. And we went into the Admiralty Islands, and uh, 
we all want to board ships, uh, different ships, and uh, uh, want to board and whatever we were going to go into, machinists or electrical or whatever, uh, we studied uh, under uh, uh, third class, second class, first class petty officers. And uh, so uh, this was in, uh, after about a year, a year and a half later, uh, in, uh, I, I sent a letter to my mother on May the 9th, 1945, it's postmark, and uh, I sent it to her for Mother's Day. And uh, I have a, a, a little verse here that I wrote down for, and I can't take 100% credit that I wrote this, although, I mean, we had no newspapers or library aboard ship. Uh, I could have gotten some, something else. I believe that I made it up and wrote it myself, but I mean, made it up myself, but I, I can't take 100% credit because I can't remember 60 years back. But anyway, it was to my mother, for Mother's Day, she kept it all the years, uh, and it was in the drawer when she had passed away. And uh, it started off, uh, though I may be a sailor now, and many miles from home, I'll always think of my dear mom, who's more than all to me. To many, Mother's Day may be a day when one remembers of a friend, a dear friend, who's truest of them all. But you know, Mom, as well as I, that to me each day is the same. For I think of you most all the time, not just on Mother's Day. Love, your son, Jay. And, and that's about the text of it. Sent there. Uh, it was postmarked May the 9th, 1945. And I don't know for sure just exactly where we were at that time, but it was uh, somewhere either off near Okinawa, off the coast of Japan. Now you wound up uh, on the ship, the USS Swanee, didn't you? The USS Swanee, one of the escort carrier. And it was attacked by uh, kamikazes, I believe, right? Well, yeah, that was in, uh, in the Philippines on uh, October the 25th, 1944. Uh, MacArthur and his troops had just gone ashore on October the 20th. And on the 25th of October, the Japanese started with their first concentrated uh, attack of kamikazes. And uh, we got hit by a kamikaze on the 25th, about four minutes to eight in the morning. Uh, he come through, hit right forward of our after elevator, which uh, knocked our after elevator out. We could still operate with the forward elevator, but it was a slow process. Then on the next day, on the 26th of October, 44, they came on us so quick, it was at, at uh, lunchtime, a bunch of us were down and uh, eating and a lot of the rest of us were up on the main deck standing in line to go down for, for uh, lunch and uh, they all of a sudden our guns started firing and we had a TBF torpedo bomber that just come in and landed and uh, taxied up on the forward elevator and by three-fourths of the way down to the to the hangar deck and uh, that kamikaze hit right on top of him and so that knocked down our forward elevator. Uh, we couldn't operate after that so uh, we came back to the states of Bremerton, Washington uh, for repairs for a couple months and went back out again. You lost a good friend out there, didn't you? Yes, I did. Very good friend from uh, uh, San Diego, California. Same age I was, 18. Uh, Johnny Bianco, B-I-A-N-C-O, and uh, one of the best friends I ever had. I still miss him. Well, uh, it's great to have. Now, Jay, how old are you now? Now, uh, I just turned 79. 79, and you're still working every day, right? That's right. <laughs> you retired from the post office? Yes, I did, in 84. Sold real estate for a while? From 85 to 95 and then became a security guard. Right, in 96. And you even have won Employee of the Year award. Yeah, one of those years I did. And you work uh, just about every day, don't you? Yes, I do. As well as travel. You've been over to Europe, to Germany, and Switzerland. Poland. Poland. Uh, Italy. Uh, Prague and the Czech Republic. 
And you've been looking up the roots of your family, uh, and those families are the Branders and the Dutzes? Uh, Dutz, D-U-T-Z. And who else? Well, on my mother's side of the family are the uh, uh, Nitskas, N-I-T-S-C-H-K-E. And you live in Erlanger? Erlanger, with right. my sister Barbara Brander Stevenson. That's right. And she's a retired school teacher. Right. From the Erlanger system. Yeah, she retired in '89. And you two have been married how many years? Uh, Fifty-three years. Fifty-three years, and have how many grandchildren? Uh, we have uh, five grandchildren. And uh, your daughter Susan's an artist and a teacher in Cincinnati, and your son Stephen is a. Uh, Professor or uh, research specialist, yeah. agriculture? Plant physiologist. Plant physiologist with yes. the government. With the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And has won several awards for doing his work. Yes, he has. Well, God bless you, and you are one of our heroes from World War II. Well, there's many more that did much more than what I did. But, uh... It's great to hear that special little note sent to your mom. Yeah. She was a wonderful lady, and your father was too. Yes, he, they, both of them were, yes. If I were to send you a cat, would you love me anyhow? Would you introduce me to your folks? Would you tell your friends no moose jokes if I were a moose? And you a cat. Would you invite me to your Would you lead me down the receiving line? Boldly folks, this moose is mine. Would your parents watch his graves? Shake their heads, it's just a phase. Would they thank the stars above for precious embers found her love? Would your grandparents change their will? They really expected a horse team boat for this we toil for the flat. You bring home someone who's not even a cow. Now there's lots of proper stock around. Market cash on Guernsey, farm around. That last one, we ridiculed the first. Second picture could do worse. Did you think this thing will last? Will he learn to moo and eat our grass? Shed his antlers in the dirt. Could you persuade him? Break it off. All the sights near the scar. You know these moose, they're all the same. They're lazy, they're stupid, they come from Maine. It's true, things slip. The moose is mine. Cows remember all the time. Bulbous nose, knobby knees, a coat in arbors, ticks and fleas. But a moose can be a handy thing. Hungry wolves come visiting. Icy gust, winter storm, our first deep dry. And someday, should your milk run dry, farmers stare with baleful eyes. In dead of night, I'd slip your news, lead you home to the land of moose. If I were a moose, if you were a cat, if you were a cat.
it's been a long time. And I want to welcome all the people here tonight for the under 99. I tell you what. I've been giving short talks since I've been here. I heard about a man who's being introduced at a conference. And he spoke for about 40 minutes, and he's supposed to speak only 20 minutes. So a man picked up a gavel and threw it at him. And this time, hit a woman on the front row. She said, hit me again, I can still hear you. Let me see you go!